Well, you guys have been going through the book of Revelation, right? And so I thought one thing that would kind of be fun to do tonight is to look at where we are in the prophetic calendar and kind of do a prophecy uh, update. And so what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 9 and Ezekiel 38. So if you want to put your fingers in Daniel chapter 9 and Ezekiel 38. And as a background, we're going to briefly turn to Daniel chapter 9 first. So you go ahead and turn there. Daniel chapter 9. And we have some cool uh, graphics we're going to show tonight. The topic, the message title is Keep Calm and Here We Go. Keep Calm and Here We Go. We want to keep calm because we have nothing to worry about, right? We know where we're going, right? Are you sure? <laughs> if you're not sure, we're going to do an altar call at the end. <laughs> you can be sure before you leave here tonight. <laughs> When verse 24 of chapter 9, Daniel, it says this, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, who is Jesus. Jesus is the most holy. Now, this prophecy is known as the 70 weeks of Daniel, and it gives us a timeline for where we are at today in the prophetic uh, calendar. Uh, in this prophecy, the coming of the Messiah is predicted. Now, verse 24 tells us that Jesus will return to establish his physical kingdom on earth after Israel is reconciled back to God. And so, you know, just freshly coming back from Israel, it's all just seems even more real to me uh, right now, just where we are in this uh, prophetic calendar. And we're told that this will happen over a period of 70 weeks. Now, the word that is used for weeks refers to a seven-year period of time. So if you take this, it's, it's basically 70 weeks or 70 periods of seven years, which equals 400 and 90 years. So that's the time span we're talking about. So 490 years will occur until Jesus resumes to rule and reign, uh, returns to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Now, according to verses 25 through 27 of Daniel chapter 9, uh, the 70 weeks are divided into three parts. And so it mentions seven weeks, then 62 weeks, and then one week. And so let's read from verse 25. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. So in verse 25, we're told that the 70 weeks begin from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, if you look at the slide, um, the next slide here, I kind of made a little timeline. Uh, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the decree, uh, was given on the 1st of Nisan, which is March 14th, 445 B.C. And it was given by Artax Xerxes. And it, it's right in the scripture when this date is, so we can actually confirm it. And so it says there will be seven weeks, or 49 years, seven times seven years, 49 years, during which the streets and the walls of Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And this was, of course, accomplished uh, by Nehemiah, he came and he rebuilt the walls and he rebuilt the, the streets in Jerusalem. And now that's ancient history. That's, that's past. In fact, uh, if you go to Israel next May, I believe it is, that, uh, that the, there's another trip planned, uh, you'll get to see the, the part of the wall that Nehemiah actually built. And so you'll get to see part of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now, verse 26 says that after 62 weeks, Messiah would be revealed. Now we know what the starting date is. The starting date is March 14th, 445 B.C. That's right in 
Scripture. So if you add seven weeks and 62 weeks, you get what? 69 weeks, right? So you have 69 weeks in total. Now if you multiply 69 weeks times seven, what you come up with is 483 years. 483 years. So from the time the uh, decree was issued to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the walls and the streets, till the time Messiah was to be revealed would be 483 years. Now, the problem comes is, is we are English, right? So we have a calendar that has 365 days. But the Jewish system is built on a lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar is built on 360 days. 360 days. And so if you take 360 days and you multiply it by 483 years, you get that number on the bottom, 1,000 or 100,073, 173,800 days. I'll finally get it. 173,000. 800 days. That's how many days from the time the decree was issued till the time the Messiah would be revealed. Now, if you add that 100 or 173,800 days to March 14, 445 BC, you actually come up with a date, and that date is April 6, 32 AD. Now, what's significant about that date, it was that on that exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Isn't that amazing? So if you ever wonder, is the word of God true? Is the word of God accurate? It is accurate to the day. I think that's like pretty radical right there. You should be freaking out right now. <laughs> um, so it's after, you know, on April 632, and then we read that when Jesus wrote in, what did they say? Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we don't have time to even get into all of that, um, what, what was happening there. But basically they were announcing that the Messiah has arrived. But we also read in verse 26 that the Messiah would be cut off and a prince would come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. And so uh, Jesus was crucified April 3rd, 33 AD. So the Messiah was cut off, and then the city and the temple were destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman general Titus. So Messiah is cut off, the city is destroyed, the temple is burnt to the ground, and 69 weeks of this prophecy, the 70 weeks of Daniel, is now ancient history. It's been fulfilled. So we can look back and we can say, wow, the word of God is true. But there still remains a 70th week. A 70th week. And we're still waiting for this 70th week to begin. But you guys are going to be covering it in the next few weeks when you look at Revelations uh, chapter 6 through 19. So Revelation chapter 6 through 19 covers what is going to happen during the 70th week of Daniel. But here in uh, uh, verse 27 of chapter 9, Daniel gives us a glimpse of what will happen in the 70th week. It says, Then he, referring to the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out, on the desolate. And so what it's telling us here is that the Antichrist will broker a seven-year peace treaty in the Middle East. And it's going to be an incredible political achievement. The temple will be rebuilt. Sacrifices will be reestablished. But after three and a half years in the middle of the week, the Antichrist will end temple sacrifices and Daniel states, on the wing of abominations shall be the one who makes desolate. This is what the Bible refers to as the abomination of desolation. And the Antichrist will do something that will desecrate the temple. And there are some examples of that in history. Uh, when Antiochus Epiphanes went in and he sacrificed a pig on the altar and he erected a statue of Zeus and he desecrated the holy place uh, within the temple. 
And so the, te- so the Antichrist will do something that will desecrate the temple, uh, and he will take control of the temple for the next three and a half years until Christ returns and the consummation will be poured out on the desolate, meaning that Jesus will come and he'll come with his saints, with you and I, and we'll be riding on our white horses and we'll come into the valley of Armageddon, you know, via the sky, and we will defeat the battles of Satan and the Antichrist uh, at the battle of Armageddon, and, and he'll be defeated once and for all. So what that tells me is if you don't know how to ride a horse... <coughs> You'll probably uh, take up some lessons now, because you don't want to be looking bad in that ride, you know. When they when they say charge, and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. It's kind of like me when I ride my Harley, and, and I like to ride in the pack, and then when they go right up the cars, it's like, forget it. Uh, I get left behind. But this is where we are today, basically. We're in the period of time waiting for the 70th week of Daniel to begin. And this period of time that we're in is referred to as the church age. So as you're going through the first uh, three chapters of Revelation, you're talking about the church age. You're talking about the age that we're in today. And so we don't know when the 70th week of Daniel is going to happen, you know. But we do know that there are some things that have to happen uh, before this will occur. And so some of these things that uh, are going to have to happen, we're going to talk about tonight. And the first thing we're going to talk about is that the temple must be rebuilt on the Temple Mount. Now, this is the Temple Mount here. Uh, This is a picture we took when we were there in Israel. And so right there where the Golden Dome is, there's supposed to be a temple. The problem is there's a Golden Dome in the way where the temple should be. And that golden dome is referred to as the Dome of the Rock. And it's part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque that's up there. And it's used to uh, worship Allah. Now, uh, and, uh, and let's go to the next slide. Ever since the second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, the Jews have wanted to build a third temple and reinstitute temple sacrifices. This is a poster that I took a picture of just on a, on a window of a store as we were walking through Jerusalem. So this is a very real thing for the Jewish people to have a third temple rebuilt. Now, the Palestinians who control the Temple Mount are not about to let Israel build a third temple. In fact, the Palestinian Authority states that only Muslims are entitled to pray on the Temple Mount. Only Muslims are entitled to pray on the Temple Mount. So if a member of the Muslim religious council sees a Jew and they are rocking or praying and they complain about it, uh, the Israeli police will arrest the Jew for threatening public welfare. That's what the charge is. They're threatening public welfare. So to pray on the Temple Mount threatens public welfare. Okay, now you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, when we were in Israel, uh, we got into a a cab with a Palestinian cab driver. And one of the things he talked about was, I can't believe these Jews want to go up on the on the Temple Mount. Or he didn't refer to it as the Temple Mount. He referred to it as the uh, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, you know, because he says, have you gone out to see any places? And we said, well, we're, we're going to go to the Temple Mount. He goes, there is no Temple Mount. It's the Al-Aqsa Mosque, you know, and he, so he said, uh, so he says, why are they wanting to go up there and pray? You know, they don't need to be up there and pray. And he referred to the Israelis as the occupation. So I'm just helping you get a mindset. So when you listen to the news and you see what the government's saying or different news agencies are saying about Israel, you get an understanding of what is really happening over there. And so if a member of a Muslim religious council sees someone on the Temple Mount praying, he can, you know, call them out and the Israeli police will arrest them for threatening public welfare. In fact, when we were on the Temple Mount, and we were just there as American tourists, just kind of looking at everything, um, on purpose, several classes of radicalized Islamic children uh, which is something that they do from the very beginning. They, they teach them to be militant, and they radicalize them with their views. 
uh, started moving towards us and they screamed out loud, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, praise Allah, there is no prophet but Muhammad. And they say, said it so loud that it almost drowned out the tour guide. We had to kind of wait for them to pass. And there was two or three classes of students that did that while we were there. Now, when the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, who recently blamed Israel for the crisis in the peace talks, and he said if Israel doesn't make peace with the Palestinians, then it would turn into an apartheid state, comparing Israel to South Africa. Okay, do you understand what, that, what the significance of that is? And the apartheid that was having in, happening in South Africa. But what's interesting is that John Kerry didn't say anything to the Palestinian President Abbas for announcing a unity agreement between the Palestinians and the terrorist group Hamas, whose whole agenda is to destroy Israel. They do not recognize Israel's right to exist. Now, how can you have peace with someone who doesn't believe you have the right to exist? How can you have peace with someone like that? You can't. You know, you can't have peace with someone that thinks you shouldn't even be here to begin with. So you can see that in order for peace to happen in the Middle East, it's not just Israel's problem, it's the Palestinians as well. So the, the solution for peace uh, to the Israeli is, is uh, um, very simple. Acknowledge our right to exist, which is what they've been saying, and honor the peace agreements that are already in existence. There are already things that have been agreed to. So just honor what's already in existence and, and acknowledge that we have a right to exist and we're okay. Well, the peace solution for the Islamic nations, the Muslims, is also very simple destroy Israel. So if you remove Israel, you've removed the problem. We can have peace. Makes sense, doesn't it? So when they are calling for peace, they mean two different things. And you need to understand that as you're listening to the news. And really the reality is, is that the only way peace will come to the Middle East is when the Prince of Peace comes and establishes his kingdom on earth. You see? There's no other way. That's why Jesus said when they say peace, peace, you know, safety, whatever, don't listen to them because sudden destruction is going to come. You know, just don't listen to it. There's no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. But the Jews are looking for a Messiah who will rebuild the third temple. So, you know, they're actually open to be deceived by a world leader that's going to come and present a solution. And so they're preparing to resume temporal sacrifices. If we go to the next slide here. On August 20th of 2013, the Temple Institute, in cooperation with other temple organizations, inaugurated a new school dedicated to teaching Kohanim or temple priests the lost art of performing the daily sacrifices of the temple. So they're just now learning how to do it. And uh, here they're learning how to, uh, you know, basically sacrifice a, a sheep. And when we visited the Temple Institute, we were told that they have already identified and are training 40 Kohanim. So they're getting ready. The Israelis are getting ready. And so all that really needs to happen is for a world leader to come on the scene who says, listen, I have a solution for your problem. Why not build the temple on the land next to the Dome of the Rock. You can have the Dome of the Rock. Just give us a little bit of land on the Temple Mount and let us build a temple. Now, this right here is referred to as the Dome of the Spirits. It's, if you were uh, looking at you know, my direction at the, um, at the uh, Dome of the Rock, the Dome of the Spirits would be to my left in a, in a, in a, a kind of a plaza area there. It's believed to be the real location of the Holy of Holies, which is important to the Jews because they want to build the Holy of Holies where it actually was. And so they believe that the temple, the Dome of the Spirits, there, go back one, 
The Dome of the Spirits is where the actual Holy of Holies is that is right below there. So it would make a logical place to place a third temple. And so um, all you need is for someone to come alongside and say, hey, why don't we build the third temple right there? Now, what if a leader came by, go to the next slide. What if a world leader came on the scene and brokered a land deal with Israel and the Palestinians that said, if Israel agrees to a two-state solution, would you give Israel the right to build a third temple on the Temple Mount? What if someone would to come on the scene and do that? Would that give them, everybody, what they need to, in order to make that happen? Well, both could worship on the Temple Mount. Both could call Jerusalem their capital. And it could end all the conflicts in the Middle East. Who knows? You know, this could be one of the solutions that this world leader, this uh, referred to as the Antichrist, as he comes onto the scene, is going to present to the world as a solution uh, for this, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state and also to allow Israel to resume their temple sacrifices. The second thing that needs to happen uh, before the 70th week of Daniel occurs is that Russia must rise to become a world military power. Now, if you turn to Ezekiel 38, we'll be in Ezekiel 38. Now, Ezekiel 38 tells us that Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal will attack Israel with a coalition of nations that include Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. Now, if you go to slide 10, Gog refers to the USSR, the, the large uh, continent, but May, or Rosh refers to Russia, the country of Russia. Meshach and Tubal refer to the region of Asia Minor that is also part of the USSR. Now what's interesting that's happened recently is that Putin was uh, chosen by time as the person of the year last year. Now also in Forbes, Forbes listed him as the most powerful man in the world. Putin is the most powerful man in the world. Now, in a New York Times article, it was reported concerning Putin that what we are seeing is a president who has no limits on his power in a country that never was democratic, that never had anything called a balance of power, where one of the estates could balance the power of another, said Vladimir Posner, one of Russia's most prominent television journalists. And as he prepares to begin his 15th year as Russia's paramount political leader, Mr. Putin's sweeping authority gives him far more leverage than his counterparts in the West to influence the course of events and at times to set the agenda in world affairs. Um, if you go to slide 13, uh, go back one, or yeah, this one here. Now, in October 2011, Putin announced the vision for a creation of a Eurasian Union. It would be the equivalent of the European Union. And Putin wants to be a major power in the world, and his vision for a strong Eurasian Union will set the stage for Russia and China to join forces against Israel. So you wonder how all these things are going to come together. Uh, it's through these alliances that they're now building that these things are going to happen. Now, Russia is increasing its spending by $132 billion over the next six years just to build up its navy. Uh, on the other hand, America is cutting its military spending by $487 billion over the next 10 years, which will basically put us on equal spending with what China is spending today. So when you look at just America making the decision we're going to spend less, and Russia ramping up to spend more, you know, you can see that the vision for Putin is to have a strong military presence in the world and to be a major world player. Now, it's been in the news that Putin uh, invaded southern and eastern Ukraine. And you might ask yourself, why did he pick those areas? Why did he pick southern and eastern Ukraine? 
Well, eastern Ukraine he needed to, to get because he needed to get eastern Ukraine so he could have a pathway to southern Ukraine. And southern Ukraine, um, where am I here? Oh, southern Ukraine is the fourth largest exporter of military weapons in the world. It has natural gas resources, iron ore, and it also has something called uranium that's needed for nuclear weapons. So Putin knows that Russia on its own may not have the resources, but with southern Ukraine, they would. They would have the resources. And so Putin is moving now quickly because Putin doesn't want NATO to control these resources. He wants to control them. And so that's why he's gone in and he's calling for elections and he's letting the people decide. Isn't that interesting? So you can see Putin's vision for Russia is to be a world power, both economically and militarily. The third thing that needs to happen is that the forces invading Israel must be prepared. The forces invading Israel must be prepared. In Ezekiel 38, verse 4, it says this, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, golly, of the house of uh, Togerma, <laughs> sorry, it's not that Gomer, from the far north and all its truth, many people are with you. Now, Ezekiel mentions Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. But when you read these names, uh, you have to understand that they're not talking necessarily about the nations of Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya that we see them today. Okay, they're not necessarily referring to that. Uh, if you go to slide 14, Persia actually refers to the ancient kingdom of Iran from Pakistan all the way over to Turkey. So it's this large kind of uh, area over the um, uh, Asia Minor there. Kush refers to the Egypt, uh, region from Ethiopia into Saudi Arabia. So it's kind of that uh, Western Africa kind of area. Uh, or East Africa uh, area there. And then Libya refers to the coastal nations on the northern part of Africa there at the top. Now, what's interesting is that as you kind of look at that, these are the nations that were aligned in the what was called in 2011 the Arab Spring, where all of the pro-Western and pro-Israeli governments were overturned and replaced with pro-Islamic governments. Now, what's interesting, what do you see there? Go back. Go back. What's interesting, what do you see there? You see Persia, Kush, and Libya. You see? All of those nations now have come into alignment. So now the prophetic stage is set. Ezekiel 38 is set and ready to go. Now, when you go to the next one and you look at the, uh, the population of Muslims, the, all the green are all the Muslim-dominated countries in that area. What do you see there? Where's Israel? It's that little white dot surrounded by all that green. They're right in the middle of all these countries that believe that they do not have the right to exist. Do you think they're getting ganged up on here? It's very interesting to me how the prophetic calendar is coming into play. And now in the Middle East, it's all set, ready to go. Now, when I showed this to a, um, a military person uh, over here from Israel, someone in the Israeli army, they were blown away. They said, that's in the Bible? And I said, yeah, it's in the Bible. And they're, and they're like, wow, that's incredible. And uh, I said, well, it's your book. You should read it. And uh, so I said, uh, and you know what else is in the Bible? And he goes, he says, what? I said, it says that Damascus is going to be leveled in a day, probably a nuclear attack or something. And he goes, oh, we're not worried about Damascus. They're in a civil war. It's not a big deal. You know, Syria is in a civil war. We're not really worried about that. I said, who are you worried about? 
And he says, well, we're worried about China. We're looking at China. Well, that's the fourth thing that needs to happen, is that China must rise as a world power. Now, something that's interesting is that China's economy is the fastest growing economy in the world. And currently, China is the second largest economy in the world, according to the World Bank. And according to the National Intelligence Council, the global balance of power will shift significantly, significantly by 2030, and China will likely become the largest economy in the world. Now, there are some economists that believe that this will happen by 2016. And if you've read the newspapers lately, they said it would happen by the end of the year, but some of those figures are, are skewed. China is also the biggest foreign holder of U.S. sovereign bonds, and they own about 10% of all the bonds sold uh, from the U.S. Treasury. That doesn't include the number of Chinese foreign investments in the United States that are all subsidized by the Chinese government. Now, the news agency Reuters reported this. There's no question China's power is growing, says Li Nan, an analyst of the Chinese military at the United States Naval War College. That is contributing to a higher level of confidence. So as China becomes more of a world player, they're becoming more and more confident. And this confidence is showing itself in a growing military presence. For instance, the tension that's happening right now in the South China Sea, right? China claims that historically they own the entire South China Sea. And so what did they do? They placed an oil rig 130 miles off the coast of Vietnam, which Vietnam sees as a violation of their sovereignty as a nation. So they're threatened by the Chinese doing this. And so China sent its navy with air support and apparently there was an act of aggression against a Vietnamese Coast Guard. And so now it's, it's pulling in world attention. And this is creating tensions between China and Japan, who's threatened by China's growing military strength. And so recently, as Obama's going over there, what's the first thing that Japan says? Hey, Obama, what are you going to do about China and this thing happening in the South China Sea? And so what does uh, America do? They say, well, we're backing Japan. So now all of a sudden, by default, we are now at odds with China in that, in that involvement right there. So you can see how all of this is going to, how something as simple as building an oil rig platform on the part of the Chinese, they have a strategy. They want to take over that entire South China. They think they own it. And so they did this on purpose as a test to see what would happen if they actually did it. You know, is, is America going to retaliate? Is another country going to retaliate? Or are they going to be able to get away with it? Now, Revelation 16 refers to the kings of the east who will bring a 200 million man army to fight in the battle of Armageddon. To date, the People's Liberation Army is 2.3 million but news sources report that there are 600 million people who are fit for military service. So when you think, can China pull together a 200 million uh, man army? Absolutely, they can do it. They're the country that has the ability to do it. And China is also moving towards a dictatorship like Russia. As reported also by the New York Times, it says, the president of China emerged from a Communist Party leadership conference with a mandate to give the market a decisive role in the world's second largest economy and to consolidate new decision-making authority in his own hands. So he's saying, look, we're the second largest economy in the world. I need to have the authority to make the decisions. You know, And so they're moving towards that. Uh, China has strong ties to Iran, uh, very strong ties, and they helped Iran develop their nuclear program. Uh, they helped I Iran develop a, uh, a, a factory uh, that could um, weaponize uh, nuclear uh, stuff. That's a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> so when, you know, when, uh, when Bush was taking heat and saying, oh, this isn't happening, it was happening. 
it was happening. And by the way, Russia just entered into an energy deal with Iran to get around the sanctions that have been placed on Iran and Russia by the U.S. because of uh, the activities in the Ukraine. So now you have Russia tied into Iran. Now you have China tied into Iran. And now you have a natural uh, relationship by which if something happens, both nations could join together and Iran would be their staging area. Interesting, isn't it? The fifth thing that needs to happen is that a global governing body must emerge. Uh, you read about that in Revelation 13. It speaks of a beast rising up out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns. Now, many believe that this refers to the European Union, but I want to introduce a potentially new thought to you. If you look at the uh, next slide, this is the UN Security, uh, UN, United Nations Security Council. And I believe that the United Nations Security Council could potentially be uh, the beast. One of the areas uh, that uh, we visited when we were in Israel uh, was the border between Israel and Syria, and right there at the border was the UN military base, you know, of operations. And so they're very active in the Middle East already. Now, currently, the UN Security Council is made up of five permanent members and ten uh, semi permanent members, or ten uh, not, you know, rotating members. So the ten members are voted on and they serve for two years. But the five other members are permanent, so they're always there. Those five are U.S., U.K., Russia, France, Russia, and China. Now, that's five. According to Revelation, there has to be seven heads, right? So you have five heads, right, permanent members, heads, and you have ten that rotate every two years. Those are horns. They have strength, and the, five he the, the heads, actually, the five permanent members can veto uh, all the other nations if, if they want to, if they so choose to. Well, what's interesting is that there's now a move to restructure the UN Security Council. And they're looking to do this because they realize that the Security Council doesn't really reflect the world balance of power. And so uh, they're toying with different ideas. One of the immediate ideas was to add uh, India as a sixth nation, They've talked about also adding a Muslim nation, which would make a seventh nation. They're looking at Turkey or Indonesia as a potential for that. And so it would be very easy to see the, the United States, uh, United Nations Security Council reformatted so you have seven permanent members and ten non-permanent members. So you would have a seven heads and ten horns. Is this going to happen? You know, who knows? But it's something that I've been watching now for a couple of years, something that's kind of got my attention. And if you remember back when the Arab Spring was happening and the attacks were being you know, flown over Libya and Egypt and all these different places, our own country, our nation, was deferring to the United Nations, saying whatever the United Nations wants to do, that's what we'll do, we'll support that. So they let the United Nations handle this world uh, kind of situation. And we see that as a trend happening more and more in the future. It would also make more sense that a military leader would emerge through the United Nations and specifically through the Security Council. So it's just something to kind of watch in the future. But the sixth thing that must happen before the 70th week of Daniel can occur is that the church must be raptured. Because we're not going to be here for this, folks. Amen? Yeah. There's a, a, an actual uh, article from the San Francisco Chronicle on millions of people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another 
with these words. Comfort one another with these words. And so when we talk about these things, when you look into the Middle East, when you look at Russia, when you look at what's happening over there, our reaction should not be fear. Our reaction should not be anxiety or worry. Our reaction should not be, oh no, what's going to happen to my future? We know what our future is. Our future is secure if you are in Christ. You see? If you're in Christ tonight, if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, all you're waiting for is that incredibly loud tower of power blast that's going to send us all to heaven. And so it should be a comfort to us. When something happens over there, oh, praise the Lord. (laughs) Carrie said what? Oh, praise the Lord. (laughs) Any day now, it's going to happen. It should be a comfort to us. But here's the thing. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you're not ready for the Lord to return. And if the Lord was to blow that trumpet right now, maybe you're sitting in your chair right now and you're saying, you know what, I don't know if I would go. I don't know where my heart is with the Lord tonight. Well, you don't have to leave this place tonight not knowing. You can make a decision tonight and make your heart secure in Christ. And all you have to do is surrender your life to him. And here's the thing. He could come back tonight. I don't think he's going to. There's a few things that got to happen first. But even if he does it, you might get in your car and be on the way home And something tragic happens, and all of a sudden you're before Jesus. And you're standing before him, and you're looking into his eyes, and he looks at you and says, who are you? Why should I let you in? Do we know each other? And that's not a conversation you want to have at that moment. That's a conversation you want to settle now. 